Yeah, who's giving us the presentation has been working 18 hours a day for the last four months. <laughs> So thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think, in fact, uh, I'll uh, do the heavy lifting on the presentation simply because Althea has been working 18 hours a day for the last four months, and I'm loath to ask her to then add to her workload by presenting. We will try to take you relatively quickly through this presentation. Happy to address questions, um, I would suggest, at the end, but if there are um, questions that need urgent uh, addressing, we're happy to take questions in the midst of the presentation. So thinking about uh, the 2020 Toronto Public Health operating budget, I know that much of the conversation and focus in and around this, uh, both this year's uh, financial situation and preparing for 2020 has actually related uh, to provincial announcements around cost sharing and um, the term I believe is modernization of public health. And these are certainly important issues which we'll get to towards the end of the presentation. But I'd like to take you through some other parts of the budget first uh, that are important as well, perhaps not getting quite the same attention, uh, but still, excuse me, very important. So going to the next slide. I think we're having technical difficulties. The next slide, I think you have hard copies in front of you. So, Oh, there we go. Uh, is the relates to the student nutrition program and the cost of nutritious food survey, a survey that we actually do on an annual basis uh, to understand how much it actually costs to provide a nutritious basket of food year over year. And this is important for us as we seek to fix the budget and uh, adjust the budget in accordance with the real life circumstances that are before us for the student nutrition program. And uh, through the work that has been done by Toronto Public Health staff, I can tell you that for 2020, the estimated year-over-year -year increase for food based on that work is 7.5%. And as a result, with that in mind, we have a request of $1.1 million to address the increased cost of food in order to continue to operate the student nutrition program. Turning to the next slide, we are now talking about programs that are funded by the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services and funding pressures related to those programs. Uh, as I elaborated to the Board of Health Budget Committee earlier this month, uh, the funding, the budget for these services and programs have remained largely unchanged for the last 12 years. And we anticipate that the 2020 budget will remain at the same level as the 2019 funding that was provided by the MCCSS. Looking towards what our inflationary, projected inflationary costs and cost of living increases are for these programs, you'll see on the slide that our estimate is at about $480.5,000. And I can also tell you that historically, these funding pressures, again, keeping in mind that the funding levels provided by MCCSS um, ha have basically been held steady for the last 12 years, what has been the practice at TPH is to absorb those uh, funding pressures, either through service efficiencies, attrition, service reductions, or a combination of all those things. And at this stage of the game, given our current situation, the recommendation that's in front of you and elaborated in the report is that we continue to absorb those pressures in 2020. Now moving on, and it's a bit of a recap here and a reminder as to the provincial funding announcements um, and their budget announcement that was made back in April. On the slide before you is a high-level summary, high-level recap of that which was contained in the April uh, provincial budget announcement. Talked about a, a new dental program for low-income seniors, some cost sharing and changes to the cost sharing relationship between the province and municipalities, the notion of public health modernization and changing how boards of health would be operating, and all this was to come with a projected annual savings of $200 million by 2021-22 through regionalization and governance changes to public health units. However, more recently, and towards mid to late August to be precise, there was an announcement that came forward from our provincial counterparts about the 2020 budget 
And those are elaborated on in the report. And the next slides start to tell us a little bit of a high-level overview as to what was actually announced in August by our provincial counterparts. So first, details on the Ministry of Health Ontario Seniors uh, Dental Care Program. What we heard from our ministry counterparts is that the ministry is prepared to provide the City of Toronto $15.5 million of 100% provincial operating funding for the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program for 2020. At this stage of the game, we are still awaiting from our colleagues at the ministry what exactly that basket of services entails. What is covered in this Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program for those who are actually eligible for services under the program? Uh, what we do know is that the income eligibility for this new uh, provincial program and the existing municipal dental program that we have here in the City of Toronto, there is some degree of overlap between these two different uh, programs. And that overlap, as you can see on the slide and in the report, is estimated to result in roughly $2.2 million in savings in the municipal dental program on an annualized basis. And as you will also see in the report, and as I'm going to tell you here, that $2.2 million savings is to be realized over two years. Part of it in 2019, and the, uh, another part, so 754,000 in 2019, and 1.4 million in 2020. Going now to the next slide, and getting into other details in respect of the Ministry of Health's um, announcements that came out in August with respect to the 2020 budget. Uh, what we did receive uh, in, in August, and I, it was, I believe it was the 21st or 20th of August that we received a letter, it was you know, in and around that time, we received communications from our colleagues at the Ministry of Health that talked about a change in the funding ratio. And as you can see here on the slide, this basically highlights that which the Ministry said. So prior to January 1st, 2020, our current time, the standard funding has been that there have been uh, two basic buckets of, of uh, programs funded by the Ministry of Health for public health. There's the cost shared element, which was cost shared at 75.25, and then there was a component that was 100% provincially funded. With the new announcement, what the province has indicated its intent to move towards is to go entirely to a 70-30 regime so that all programs would now be 70% provincially funded, 30% municipally funded. That, and there would be no longer 100% provincially funded programs. Uh, further to that, in the letter to the board chair and to myself, uh, there was indication that we should be using the time that is before us now to, to plan for this funding change, to bring our share as a municipality to 30% as of January 1st, 2020. So what does that mean? You know, now that we have that notion conceptually, what the funding change looks like in, in concept, what does that mean in terms of dollars? It looks exactly as it appears here on this slide. When you add up the numbers, and uh, you know, we can get into specific details, but to be mindful of time, the long and the short of it is that the change from the cost shared 75-25 plus 100% provincially funded to a purely 70-30 regime for Toronto Public Health means overall that the province's contribution decreases by a little over 14 million and the city's contribution increases by a matching amount in order to balance out the dollars. And I refer to uh, our financial guru on the other side of the room there uh, to correct me if there is a, if I've oversimplified it, but to my mind that is the short version of the story. So turning to the next slide, what we also heard from our provincial counterparts was uh, of the availability of one-time mitigation funding. And if you will allow me for a moment, I will quote from the letter uh, from the Ministry to our Board Chair. The letter specifically stated, to help provide additional stability as municipalities begin to adapt to shifting funding models, 
our government will also provide one-time mitigation funding to assist all public health units and municipalities. Uh, there is, it goes on to say, while confirmation of 2020 funding will be provided through the 2020 budget process, we expect that all municipalities will be protected from any cost increases resulting from this cost sharing change that exceed 10% of their existing costs. So with what I've told you about the change from 75, 25 plus 100% to 70, 30, and with that quote provided by the Minister of Health, what is depicted on this slide is what we anticipate the final impact will be premised on that information that we've received. And at the end of the day, what it looks like uh, premised on this information is that knowing what, we, uh, what the 2019 Council approved budget was for public health, taking that figure, calculating 10%, what you have is $4.324 million as a 10% increase in 2020 over what was spent by the city in the year preceding. Okay, and what that, uh, if I can just elaborate a little bit further on that slide, that's the, you know, that's what uh, the city ends up having to spend in order to take advantage of the one-time mitigation funding that the province has indicated. Remember, I talked about 14 million being the overall increase to the city. If the city is not to spend more than 10%, as indicated by the minister's letter, the 10% is the 4 million, and the difference between those two is, is uh, about what you have there on the slide, the 9.764.8 million dollars. So going on uh, to talk about that which was provided in the ministry's letter, the ministry did not provide for inflationary or cost of living increases in 2019. And in terms of preparing for the 2020 operating budget and the operating budget submission, we do not expect to receive a budget increase for these items in 2020. High level summary of that, again, much more elaborated uh, in the report. We have a total pressure related to inflationary and cost of living increases for 2020 of roughly $4.5 million. So what you have in front of you now is, uh, and I don't seem to have that slide in front of me, but so perhaps Althea, I may get you to help me out with this slide because uh, I can't actually see it here. So what you have in front of you now is basically a year over year picture of what our budget um, submission would be to through the city process with the approval of the Board of Health. So I'm going to quickly run through most of these numbers you would have seen either they're either depicted and explained in the report or they've been provided for within the slide themselves. So we have a couple of items. We start out with the 2019 council approved budget. During the course of the year, there would be what we call in your approvals and technical adjustments. These are things like, um, you know, we had some uh, cost transfer to us from the real estate division for two property leases. There were some minor technical things in terms of uh, the insurance uh, reserves. So what that brings us to is what the city likes to refer to as the 2019 operating budget. And it's from that basis that the city would actually calculate what the year over year uh, increases. And what you have depicted for in front of you on this slide is basically a sort of detail item, a detailed um, detail summary of the items that bring the change about. So we have the student nutrition program, which Dr. Davila spoke to in terms of the increase in the cost of food. We also through also have the student nutrition program for independent schools. This is already prior approved by city council, but we need to bring it forward uh, as part of the process for the city's budget process. We also have the some additional administrative and technical changes that actually occur in 2020, predominantly having to do with how um, capital is recorded within the city, as well as um, some minor changes that we have related to change in uh, fees and how that impacts some of the salaries that our other fees and um, other revenues might impact. 
We've got the annualization of the Ontario Seniors Dental Program. Um, that is, the, of course, in 2019, we asked for a $2 million increase, and this just shows us bringing us up to the $15 million mark. The, um, the next one is basically the Public Health Inspectors Practicum Program. There again, this is a 100% funded um, program from the Ministry of Health, where they have provided us with an additional $10,000 per year for this program. We do have a reversal of some one-time funding that we received from the Ministry of Health. And as would have been noted in the report, but not necessarily reflected on this, is that um, in the, the 11th hour, after we had actually made our submission to the city, we received a subsequent letter from the Ministry of Health indicating that for one of those items, in particular the supervised injection site, that they are going to be giving us back uh, funding for the one time. We're in discussions with them to figure out how do we want that money allocated between 2019 and 2020. And frankly, um, the discussion is we want to make sure that we're able to optimize the funding to our best advantage. So we're in discussions with them about how to make that split. Um, as well, we also have, as Dr. DeVilla already indicated, the financial impact of the changes for the actual funding ratio. And uh, it's been netted against um, the amount of money that we're going to be getting from the province or we anticipate getting from the province for the one-time mitigation. That's that $4.3 million. Then the other next two items are basically the inflationary pressures, again, which Dr. DeVilla has spoken to. Long and short of it, our pressures are basically $10.4 million year over year. And to that, what we have um, highlighted is a couple of um, um, sort of uh, budget reduction or service efficiencies, which I will uh, turn over to Dr. DeVilla at this point. Thank you, Althea. So as you've heard, year over year increase, roughly $10.4 million made up of those various components that you've just been described. And we also have to try to, to, to counterbalance, to offset those increases, a number of efficiencies that have been considered by the Board of Health Budget Committee. Three proposals detailed in the report totaling $1.6 million, and we've got some of that, I believe, on the next slide, and another six proposals which are outlined in the confidential attachment to the report. So with that, perhaps we should just wrap up the presentation. Happy to take any questions uh, members of the board may have on any of the presentation and or the report itself. Uh, just before we move into questions, we did have one person who had registered to depute on this, but I don't believe Carolyn Egan is still here. Um, no, Mr. Chair, um, just because of scheduling, uh, she was not able to stay, um, so I think that uh, she won't be speaking. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're going to move into public questions. Um, if there's a desire for anybody to go into camera, we'll then move in camera, but we'll start with public questions here first. Um, and then if, if people wish to go in camera. Uh, I'm going to take a liberty here to kick off questions um, for my round to begin. So I just want to be very clear so we all understand. The provincial changes, the most recent ones that have been announced, from a, which is a 70-30 cost share, 100% down to 30, 75 down to 70, which may yet change again, and we're advocating for that. So in 2020, the impact of those changes after the one-time mitigation loss of funding is 4.3 million, is that right? Yes, that, yes that's okay. correct. And in 2021, so the one-time mitigation funding the province was proposed, that is not in place in 2021. So what is our early estimate about what that funding gap, that cut would be in 2021? At a minimum, it would be 14.1. 14 million, okay. So then I just want to break down your chart on page 10, just so we're all on the same page. This is in the Board of Health Budget Committee. We dived in depth into a lot of this. So our, going into 2020, our, our pressures on the budget, there's a $4.3 million provincial cut related to the pressure, the cost share change. Then I see a um, four, four, is it a $4.5 million reduction related to cost of living adjustment unfunded by the province? That is correct. In both 19 and 20? Well, it, it's, yes, that's correct. Okay, so that's 4.3 and 4.5. Then we have 1.1 million in our student nutrition program 
uh, related to inflationary increase in the cost of food? That is correct. That's 2019 into 2020, year-over-year -year increase, okay. 1.1 million. And then the other two I see, so the 300,000 for student nutrition program, independent schools expansion, and 184,000 for admin adjustment. So that's 10.4 million. That is correct. Okay, so we started at a, so we started at an, uh, a gap going into 2020 of 10.4. There are savings recommended totaling 4.5 million. That is 1.6 million from the through initiatives you mentioned, as well as some proposals on, or, on purple paper. That is correct. That is correct. Okay, so 10.4 minus 4.5. So that's the 5.9 million is the outstanding pressure. That is correct. Okay. And the recommendation here in the budget that the Board of Health is considering is for us to ask the City of Toronto to make up that difference unless the province reverses its cut. That is correct. And there is a recommendation in here that continues to call on the province to reverse it, correct? I believe that recommendation is there. Let's confirm. It, that, that was a recommendation of the Board of Health Budget Committee. I believe yes, I have to move it correct. again just to make sure it's captured. That is correct. Okay. Okay, and then as it relates to the savings that were here, the Board of Health in, in Budget Committee and the Board of Health, our previous direction was to request staff to look for options for savings that do not negatively impact population health status. So the saving options that we're looking at here, do they have a negative impact on population health status? So we specifically uh, propose those because they don't. Okay, so these are savings that we might look at regardless of the provincial pressures imposed upon us. These are ones we would look at always. Some of them certainly. I would suggest that the pressures uh, and the provincial announcements uh, drove us um, to uh, look at them more seriously. Okay, those are all my questions, thank you. Uh, Director Layton. Thank you. Uh, this is to those, the, the enhanced programs that are the reduction proposals. Can you just explain them? Not the ones on the purple paper, but the ones that are listed, the Safe Water Initiative and the Food Safety Haynes Initiative. I sure. don't know what they are. So what we were, what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, so the, the three uh, public budget reduction options relate to the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program, certain service efficiencies with respect to safe water and, and food safety. Uh, so those are the three that we have in front of us um, that are mentioned in the report outside of the confidential attachment. With respect to the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program, I had mentioned earlier that we're anticipating a savings uh, as a result of the overlap between the criteria for the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program and the pre-existing municipal dental program. Um, and that the overlap um, uh, we felt would uh, provide a savings of $2.2 million um, uh, you know, on an annualized basis. We've recommended that we um, take this into consideration partially in 2019 and partially, partially in 2020, sure. and the 1.4 million of it be accounted for. I, I'm more concerned with, the, I, I, I think I get that one, I'm more concerned with the other two, because why would they, why would we have them on the books as programs that we thought were you, worthwhile eight months ago, and now recommend that they not be included? So completely appreciate your question. Through the chair, those are two particular service efficiencies that we're recommending. Those were programs that were previously 100% funded by the province and are now caught up in this 70-30 shift. Um, I can tell you that you know, you'll have seen in the report that those service efficiencies won't have an impact in respect of inspections performed in either the uh, water safety or safe water program or the food safety programs. Um, happy to have um, my colleagues uh, here at the table. Dr. Shapiro can probably speak more specifically to the nature of the programs, but I just wanted to be clear for the members of the board that inspections would not would, be affected. I was just, if, if they were on our books but they weren't necessary, why were they on our books? Why, why were we so, even yeah, so contemplating them if they wouldn't add a level of protection? Yeah, 100% funded programs in the past and allowed us to do certain, um, you know, increased signage, increased public education in respect of, of safe water, uh, allowed for some opportunities uh, and perhaps a greater number of staff to participate in training initiatives. Uh, and I'm looking at Dr. Shapiro, have I missed anything? I knew that were some, some uh, communications campaigns that were allowed through those funds. Enhancement of uh, different disclosure websites that we have, like she said, training, staff to attend different meetings that would be outside of the City of Toronto. 
things like okay. that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes. Uh, simply because I know that our speaker is not here, but uh, what she was going to speak about was around funding for sexual health clinics. Is there anything in the report based on the recommendations that are before us that will put funding at risk for sexual health clinics? So through the chair, there is nothing specific in the report around funding for sexual health clinics. We have uh, we plan to continue to provide the existing resources across the various services. Again, keeping in mind that we just released, uh, as we discussed earlier this morning, um, the health status report, and trying to make sure that we're putting our resources towards those areas that can give the most um, impact in terms of improving health status. But there isn't anything specific um, contemplated with sexual health clinics at, at this point in time at this point in time and if the province continues to insist on a set uh, the, the change to the formula 100 to 70 30 um, and we do have to do some of that t uh, belt tightening within uh, the city coffers uh, will sexual health clinics uh, be put forth as one of the services that you would consider reducing uh, because we'll have to make some choices uh, or we raise the taxes to pay uh, what the province won't pay? So through the chair, we've put forward some uh, budget reduction options, uh, and I believe you have some materials in respect of that. Uh, I think we would have to look at all of our activities. I don't think that there is any activity that we would look at to try to understand where are we getting the best value for our uh, residents in terms of putting resources that give us the most impact, health status, improved health status, and reduced disparities. So I would say that we'd look at everything, and uh, that's exactly what our senior leadership team is doing. And, uh, and because the, the deputy was not able to stay, um, when, they, when she and her colleagues uh, uh, come back to city council and to, by way of committee, uh, would it be recommended that she be deputing at the budget committee then? To, to make her case uh, to, to save and support the funding for sexual health clinics? Uh, so through the chair, I, I don't know if there will be a specific item. I certainly wouldn't uh, tell anybody not to come to the budget committee. I think that that's a reasonable thing to do uh, if, if there's a particular area of funding that one is concerned about. Uh, I don't know that there is a, a specific item to speak to, but I would certainly not tell anybody not to depute uh, if they have concerns around budget. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Director Perks. Just, just to follow up on Councillor Wong Tam's questions, um, I know that for several of the services that are directly delivered, we're absorbing and finding efficiencies. In other words, we're not giving inflationary increases. Is that the case for when we provide funding to partner agencies to deliver services like the sexual health clinics? Are we saying flatline or are they getting inflationary increases? So through the chair, I believe there was council direction uh, specifically around our contracted agencies and reflecting changes that we make within our own city organization and that our contracted agencies should benefit from those same uh, increases. Althea, you might be able to speak more specifically to it then. Is that not correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, it has to do really around the concept of wages. So if uh, the direction that we have is that if we have contracted out, we have a service provider, or through the chair, if we have a service provider who provides a particular wage, if the city also has um, any sort of changes in sort of the wage grid, that's, there's an expectation that that change is applied to our service providers as well. And that has been encapsulated in the um, $3.463 uh, million for 2020. So we have included a portion around wages for that. Okay, and, and, and that's good and useful information, but the question I asked was more general because, uh, you know, service providers, external partners are going to have costs outside of staff. I'm just wondering, are we, uh, other than the requirement around workforce, and, uh, is there a flatlining of external partners uh, for services that they provide? So through the chair, I believe those are actually accounted for within the context of the contracts that we negotiate. I don't know that there is a specific flat fee applies to all. Each contract is negotiated separately, and I think that that 
those terms are covered in each of those contracts. So I don't know that there is a uniform uh, arrangement outside of wage. I, fair. Um, I do know that in past years, in, around sexual health clinics in previous years, there have been times uh, when during our budget process, we've simply said, no, this is what you're getting. Uh, we may have an agreement with you, but this is what you're getting because we have our own internal budget processes. I'm just asking, in the budget that you are putting in front of us, is there anything where there was an expectation of an inflationary increase for any partner of any service we deliver where we are saying, no, because we're absorbing costs, we're passing along that cost absorption to you? So through the chair? Uh, I, I, we have not, I have not been privy to those conversations. We have not said to anybody we are passing costs along to you. Uh, we have requests. I just received a request recently, but no decision has been taken yet around how best to manage that. So we are actually looking at all of our programs uh, to understand what, what uh, all of our contracts and anyone who comes forward asking for a particular increase will be managed as an individual um, situation in and of itself. There isn't a flat rule that goes across all of those organizations. Maybe I'm going to have to take this offline. Okay. Uh, any other questions in public? Okay. There is a request to go in camera. Um, so let me do that to deal with the purple paper. So I have a motion that the Board of Health recess its public session and meeting closed session to consider this item uh, as it relates to personal matters. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then there's another motion here, um, and it is to permit, as we're going in camera solely as the board, it is to permit my chief of staff, and I also have representatives in the mayor's office, though I don't, I don't believe they're here at the moment, uh, that they're permitted to attend the in-camera portion as well. On a point of, point of order, do we want to ask your chief of staff if she wants to stay or if she... <laughs> I don't think you want to hear me. <laughs> okay. All those, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. We'll wait until the doors are closed. Point of levity.
So we're back in public. Just going to see if there are any uh, speakers in public. Okay, speakers in public. I will be putting myself on the list. I'm happy to kick things off. Okay, uh, so first of all, I will move the staff recommendations and then I will also be moving. Yeah, he's speaking, he's spe I'm speaking first and he can speak. Um, sorry, one second. Okay, sorry, that's been sorted. So I will be moving the staff recommend the recommendations in front of us. I will also, and I have an amendment, if it can be put on the screen, this is, this is I'm moving the recommendation from the Board of Health Budget Committee as well. Uh, so this is uh, formally requesting the province of Ontario to re reverse the new cuts. This is the second round and the second attempt at downloading and also direct that the confidential information uh, within the confidential attachment uh, to remain uh, such through the budget process. So a few comments. Um, this has been for our staff an exceptionally tough budget process, unlike any that they've ever had to go through, precisely because everything keeps changing. So in April, we found out that our budget, our cost share was going down to 50-50, starting at 70-30 this year, then 60-40 next year, and then 50-50. Then that was reversed in response to the wave of opposition. We were all part of that. Then in the middle of August this year, without any warning or notice, yet another announcement was made. This time, it was that the cost share reduction was going down to 70-30 instead of 50-50. Certainly better, but just as short-sighted. And so that was the second change. And I fully expect that we're going to see a third change. I fully expect that the cost share model will ultimately be reversed back to what it was. But we cannot sit, simply sit and wait for that. We have a job to do. And we have work that needs to carry on. And thus, as we continue to advocate for that cost share reduction, we need to carry on with our budget process. So the budget in front of us today is one where we have done the hard work as the Board of Health and the Board of Health Budget Committee and staff of rolling up our sleeves and looking for opportunities where we can improve public health services while at the same time reducing costs. We've done that hard work and we've identified savings, but there remains a gap due directly to the province and their cuts, a gap of $5.9 million. And so while we're gonna to continue to call on the province to reverse the cuts on us, we're asking the City of Toronto to step up and cover our gap. Uh, so that we don't lose, uh, so that we don't go backwards. And maybe I'll just close on that by saying that we truly at this time should be talking about how we scale up our investments in public health. When we look at the uh, comprehensive population health status that we started with this morning and we saw the increasing poverty and the impact it's having on people's health and how that's highly concentrated in certain neighborhoods and that the trend lines are getting worse, not better, in this year, we should be thinking about how do we do a better job delivering public health services to people who need them and improving policy to help shape those outcomes as opposed to how do we save what we've got. But that's the situation we're in and we're doing our best to save it. And, we're, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, Director Perks. I'll never get used to that. Um, so I, I have a motion which I'll explain while the clerk is struggling through it because it means we have to change all the numbers in the recommendations. Uh, essentially, I'm going to be moving a motion that will have the effect of increasing our, the contribution we make to creating Health Plus uh, by $55,000 both gross and net, which means the clerk has to change all the numbers in recommendation one. And I'm very sorry about that. I'm a bad man. I'm a terrible man. Um, some of you may remember during last year's uh, work to develop the budget, uh, we were approached by uh, this organization that delivers a program called Creating Health Plus, which is a coalition of organizations, very small, that uh, provide nutritious food to people who are homeless and going to various food drop-ins or getting food as part of some kind of program. Uh, the program 
uh, was established several years ago. Ago, uh, the amount of money for the food, the amount of support for the organization, and the number of drop-ins that are eligible to participate has never grown. So while the demand uh, has been growing, uh, and certainly the homelessness population has been growing, or the people who are struggling to be in homes is growing, uh, we continue to provide the same service level. Uh, you will probably all know, and if you don't, it's easy to intuit, that uh, a simple intervention in providing nutritious food can deal with this, one of the populations whose life expectancy is, is tremendously impacted by the fact that they don't get to eat fruits and vegetables and other nutritious food as part of their daily lives. Uh, it's a very small amount of money that they've asked for, but it will allow them to uh, keep up with some of the increasing demand that we're experiencing on the front lines where these vital programs take place. Uh, there's a piece that I'm also going to be advocating for on the shelter housing and support side, where they participate in delivering it as well, but there's a piece we have to do here. Any questions of the mover? Okay. Um, are we, we're still waiting on that. Any other speakers while we're uh, while clerks are finalizing that? Okay. Um, play amongst yourselves. We're just going to hold tight until it's ready, and then and then we'll vote on the amendments. Um, our final item, and just as a heads up, so we have we have eight of us in the room. Quorum is seven, and we have one item after this with no deputants on it. Just so people know what's coming next. So just hold tight. Okay. If we can put that on the screen, please. So this is with the adjustment of the 55,000 adjustment. Okay, so uh, the amendment by Councillor Perks. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries, okay. Uh, these are the recommendations that I'm moving on behalf, coming from the Board of Health Budget Subcommittee. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Uh, and then do I have as amended? Adopt, Adopt as amended. All those opposed, or in favor. <laughs> Oppose, if any, carried. All right, we have officially submitted a budget. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, we will now move to, uh, we have two new business items. Item 9.10. Is health concerns associated with vapor products? Uh, we're going to have a very quick, very, very quick, because I know people have to leave presentation on that. Um, perhaps I'll just hold that down for one second, because I suspect the other will be quick. Yeah. Um, so the other item, which is 9.11, Canadian Institute of Health Research, Healthy Cities Research Initiative, planning grant for implementing healthy public policy. This was brought directly from staff. It has a zero net impact on us, as it's grant related. Uh, is there any questions for staff on this one? Okay. Speakers, I will move the recommendations. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? If any, carried. Okay. So we are on to our final item, which is 9.10. Uh, it's a new business item I submitted related to health concerns associated with vaping products. And Dr. Davila, you have a brief presentation for us. So presentation is getting called up now, but just to let you know at the request of the chair, I'm giving you a brief update of what we know so far about the issue uh, with respect to vapor products and severe pulmonary disease, something which I'm sure you've heard about as it's been quite uh, active on media over the last uh, several weeks. And uh, just wanted to let you know what we're doing and what we will continue to do um, with this evolving issue. So high level summary, we know that as of September 17th, uh, our colleagues in the United States have reported 380 confirmed and probable cases of severe lung disease and seven deaths associated with the use of vapor products, also known as e-cigarettes. 
Um, the number of cases fluctuates uh, as investigations are continuing and as data evolves over time. What we can tell you, premised on the information from our colleagues in the U.S., is that most of the affected individuals actually have reported use of vapor products or e-cigarettes uh, containing uh, cannabis-related products. But we don't actually yet know what the ultimate cause of the severe pulmonary illness illnesses are. We still don't understand fully what this means. Investigations are continuing. There is some suggestion, I'm sure you'll have seen them in the media, around an oil contained in the e-substances that may be linked to cases of a particular kind of pneumonia. Um, but again, very much an evolving situation, still not completely understood by all of the authorities. On September 18th, so towards the end, uh, middle of last week, I guess, what was believed to be the first Canadian case of, of this um, vaping-related pulmonary illness was reported in a high school-aged youth here in Ontario, found by our colleagues at the Middlesex London Health Unit. Physicians there essentially saw the case, found that there were no other causes or potential causes for the symptoms that were seen in that in young individual, save and exclude for the use of a vapor product. So moving to the next slide, on September 4th, Health Canada issued an information update advising Canadians who use these products, these vapor products, to monitor themselves for symptoms of pulmonary illness, including things like cough, shortness of breath, chest pain. And if you have any of these symptoms, Canadians were advised to seek medical attention promptly, um, particularly if they had concerns that, uh, that um, these were having significant impacts on their health and may be different than what they would have otherwise seen. Bless you. Uh, health Canada has also stated that, um, you know, those who are concerned about these specific health risks uh, should refrain from using vapor products. So what have we been doing? What are we doing as Toronto Public Health in respect of this issue? Well, we have a number of roles to play uh, as part of the system that is in place to identify emerging health risks. Uh, with respect to acute vaping-related uh, severe pulmonary illnesses, what we're doing is we're actively monitoring the issue locally, and we are engaging with our provincial counterparts, particularly Public Health Ontario and the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Um, you likely will have heard through media reports as well that the Minister of Health uh, last week issued an order requiring public hospitals to provide the Provincial Chief Medical Officer of Health with information on vaping-related severe pulmonary disease so as to facilitate data collection and an understanding of what the situation is here in the province of Ontario. Uh, beyond that, what we're doing at Toronto Public Health is that we're uh, liaising with health care providers um, to ensure that they have up-to-date information in respect of what's happening on the ground and what we're hearing from our federal and provincial partners, who in fact are actually the, um, the lead agencies right now in respect of the situation. On general vapor product use and promotion, uh, we do have some roles to play and we will continue to play those roles. We have a provincial mandate to enforce the Smoke-Free Ontario Act and that does include regulations in respect of uh, the sale and use of vapor products or e-cigarettes. And we are, of course, working with our public, particularly parents, children and youth, to make sure that they're aware of and fully appreciate the risks associated with the use of these vapor products. Um, Again, the, the risks are heightened right now. There are particular concerns. Uh, this is a good moment for education, uh, but um, that will continue, uh, I think, for the foreseeable future, our role uh, in these various mandates. So with that, I'll wrap up the presentation. Happy to take any questions, and I know that my colleagues are here as well to um, help answer some questions. All right. Uh I have Director Donaldson and then Director McKelvey. Thanks. So at what point does, uh, is this deemed so dangerous that a product would be taken off the market? 
So through the chair, uh, you know, that's something that uh, is not within our purview. Yep. Uh, it is something that would happen at, at Health Canada. I have, have not been uh, privy to those conversations. I don't know whether, Lauren, is there anything in particular that you've heard through your circles closer to the ground? No, but I think the, the uh, feeling is that on the basis of these acute cases, it's not really enough information to call for a ban. Um, that there needs to be more information to understand exactly why the cases are, why they're happening all of a sudden, because we've had e-cigarettes in Canada for over 10 years. And are we aware of whether or not the technology in these e-cigarettes has changed recently that would attribute to the change? So through the chair, to my knowledge, no, but I, I would expect that that must be part of the conversation to try to understand, um, you know, what has precipitated this now. Right. Um, I'll just share, I've been talking to many students uh, at the secondary level in particular about this issue, and I think part of, part of the problem is that the vape smoke, or the vapor, is completely undetectable. So I know in TDSB schools we don't have any of these vape alarms that exist in some boards. They do exist in the Thames Valley District School Board, where I think there, there was the recent case of the student who was hospitalized, and uh, educators are spending a lot of time policing this. Some of the kids I talked to, they said they don't even call it the change room anymore, they call it the vape room. Uh, so, and anybody who you talk to is, is saying it's just off the charts, it's dramatic, the amount of vaping that's happening in our schools right now. So I just want to thank everybody for bringing forward this report, and uh, it's something that we take very seriously at the DDSB and we'll be taking action on. So if I may, through the chair, just in response to the, the rapid increase, mm -hmm. I think it may be worth uh, those around the board table to know and appreciate that the most currently available data on this issue suggests that there is a rapid, mm -hmm. there has been a rapid increase in vaping rates amongst our young people. Um, so the most currently available information that I could find, courtesy of our colleagues at University of Waterloo, 74% increase of uh, vaping rates amongst those 16 to 19 years of age from 2017 to 2018. Uh, and I would add too, it's not just in our secondary schools. I mean, it's, it's students grade six, seven and eight too in our elementary schools, so it's across the board. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Director McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my questions are on a similar lens, but more how did these get on the market? Like, it seems like drugs require significant testing, and you know, how did this get on the market so quickly, and what was that path? So, through the chair, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that it was particularly quick. Again, you, you've heard from one of my colleagues who's a little closer to the ground on this issue that these products have been available in this country for around 10 years now. Um, uh, it's it's uh, because the investigation is still underway. I'm not sure that we actually know what it is, you know, and whether these are in fact newer products. Um, I think we have to continue monitoring and understanding with our partners. So, what seems to be at the heart? What is the? Um, what are the strong associations? What do we see? What are the similarities amongst the many different cases? So that we can then appreciate what uh, are the causes and have very specific directed interventions. And, and I appreciate that e-cigarettes have been around for 10 years, but specifically like the e, like the cannabis that was available on market pretty soon. So it didn't have any sort of trials or anything, did it? So through the chair, I think, uh, you know, if there's one thing I can and say, uh, you know, we've had many conversations at this table around the illicit drug market. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, there are many, many channels uh, by which drugs get into the marketplace. Uh, I, I don't know that we're particularly expert in understanding all the many channels, um, you know, with respect to, uh, um, And you then know. just the, the last question on that, like for the e-cigarettes then, for example, um, and, and, and um, Director Mulligan just pointed out that there's no, that, E-cannabis e isn't really actually a permitted product. Sorry. Right. Um, so products that are permitted, is there like a, a stringent QAQC process affiliated with them and reporting to, if the product changes over time that it has to be reported in some way? 
So, uh, you know, Lauren, I may ask you to, if you have any particular insights around the quality assurance and quality controls. I just want to make sure I understand the question in respect of those products that are uh, licensed and available for sale in Canada. Um, well, the technology has evolved over time, and it's Health Canada's role to uh, to oversee product safety uh, assurances. And I think it's the acute cases are really profiling the fact that there are regulated uses, and then there are illicit, unregulated uses, which you know the, uh, the government can only do so much about the former or the latter. And they, really their role is about the former, about trying to ensure product safety when you use it as, a, as the manufacturer intends. Any other questions? I have just a couple. Um, in 2014, before, um, I wasn't a counselor at the time, but uh, a number of you were, did the Board of Health not consider e-cigarettes and vaping at the time? So what, were the what was the position put forward from the Board of Health to the province in 2014? We're going to tag team, we've got a group effort here through the chair. So the matching regulation for tobacco is what we were looking for. So we asked that in retail outlets that children or youth access, convenience stores, uh, gas stations, uh, not have the promotion of vaping products. They do now. And that's provincially. Federally, we asked for there to be stricter limitations on flavors that would appeal to youth, as well as limited what's called broad media promotion, so billboards and radio, TV, etc. Those uh, things that I mentioned have not happened, but Health Canada continues to look at how they will regulate. So the uh, ongoing work will be done by us to continue to make the case for those things that help limit tobacco and combustible form access for youth which are promotion in retail outlets, the flavors, and limited of promotion in the broad scale media. So, can Did I, I just... miss anything? No, we'll just I check. I think that's good. Because this goes way back, so we need a team. Yeah. So, I just want to make sure. So, in 2014, the Board of Health requested the province to not allow promotion in spaces. What kind... I just want to... Retail outlets that children access. Okay. So they wanted to limit it to specialty stores that are only accessed by adults. Okay. So we, in 2014, the Board of Health requested the province to limit promotion to venues where only adults could access, and the federal government to limit flavors that were not appealing to children and to have some limits on advertising. Do I have that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. For you, Mr. Chair, can I just, 2014? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Just okay. So in 2000, and those three recommendations, were any of those three recommendations followed? Well, again, this is tag team. So the Health Canada ones, they are still refining their regulation. I'm seeing a nod. Yeah. For the province, they did not limit the promotion in retail outlets access. Well, let's children. see if they do it in 2019. <laughs> okay. Okay. Those are all my questions. Thank you. I'm just going to add a little bit of an answer because I was in the room. I also, the staff said probably the smartest thing I've ever heard about vaping, which is if you could go back in time when they introduced cigarettes, wouldn't you want to act? I was a uh, editorial special from uh, Councillor Perks. Okay, speakers on this item. Uh, Director Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I want to thank staff for uh, for raising the issue once again at, at the Board of Health. Uh, I was also, uh, during my short time at the Board of Health, uh, there for that particular meeting. I think much of uh, what was raised uh, years ago by this particular body uh, has not been adequately addressed by either orders of government. Uh, this was sort of the front line of defense in, in some ways. Um, and uh, and uh, as, uh, as in some other items, with other um, particular uh, subject matters that affect public health uh, for our civilian population, once again, we're in a position of asking other orders of government to come in and step up and do their work and to do it as quickly as possible. And, uh, and we have now learned, once again, that they, they have not necessarily stepped in uh, with the type of active and effective leadership that we require them to. The, the challenge that I see with, uh, with respect to vaping now is that it is entirely out of the gate. Uh, and because this is um, a subject uh, uh, material that seems to be rather harmless, that is targeting specifically uh, at youth, uh, and in particular um, uh, individuals uh, with uh, the same type of um, 
marketing and lifestyle branding campaign that we saw uh, early on with the tobacco industry, uh, it should be no surprise to anybody in the room, for those who follow the issue very carefully, is that many of the big actors within the vaping um, uh, commercial side of the world is actually heavily invested in big tobacco. Uh, so they know exactly what they're doing. They know who to, uh, to lobby. They know how to, to position their product and how to get it out into the gray area in the open markets. So if other orders of government, including those uh, health bodies that are uh, mandated to protect uh, uh, the civilian population, doesn't do their job very quickly, uh, we will be down this rabbit hole for another 10 years. 15, 20, 30 years uh, with a number of health impacts that we will be uh, seeing along the way, uh, diagnosed at, at, by the front lines of the medical profession and then largely left untreated because the symptoms and the cause uh, are not going to be directly linked uh, in any way in, by policy. So if we saw that, um, that tobacco created a lot of harm, uh, amongst its users, I think what we're going to see here is that this is going to be even worse uh, because we're talking about chemical consumption uh, with instruments that are untested. There is no, um, there's no standard whatsoever. It's not just a rolling paper. Uh, there's not just a, a, a pipe filter. Uh, it is literally all over the place. And the um, and and of course all those wonderful candy flavors and and the little cool little sticks that people are sucking on as uh, as we're seeing them everywhere is just going to cause uh, mayhem and havoc on the health system. So I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg, and I think what we're going to see is much worse. So anything that we can do um, at the City of Toronto through this body and through the leadership of our uh, public health staff to sort of raise the alarm bell and as quickly as possible and as loudly and as widely as possible, I think we should do um, and, uh, and do it with the, the same level of urgency um, and more so now in 2019 than we did in 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other speakers? Okay, um, I will simply uh, move the recommendations in my letter, uh, which is to ensure that we have a presentation uh, at our December 9th meeting and a report back from, from our team at that point on the health impacts of vaping and recommendations, uh, building on that which we recommended in 2014 for anything else, both for the city but other, also other levels of government. Uh, but I won't say anything more than that because uh, Director Wong Tam, Vice Chair Wong Tam, Kristen Wong Tam, she caught it all. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes what has been a long meeting of the Board of Health. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the patience and your attention on this. Thank you.